And then when you're done, can you see how all the sephirots intersect all of... It gives you the exact correct geometry, giving you the 64 tetrahedron grid and the vector equilibrium in the middle. That's just fantastic. That's just fantastic. I, I was just mind blown. And so you can see that in the, in, in the Bible, that all of the ancient knowledge of the Old Testament of the Bible is describing this technology, is describing this power. A crystal full of eyes, right? A crystal full of eyes, as described by Ezekiel, looks like this. The petals of the intersecting field of each tetrahedron generating singularity generates eyes-like structure and certainly would generate a lot of radiance and a lot of rainbows <laughs> if it's a mini black hole. And so I was, uh, I was looking at it and I started to trace back the, the movements of the arc. And because we're running out of time, I'm not going to go into too many details on that. But the arc seemed to have moved from one place to the other. And every time it would move from one place to the other, the, the symbol of the star of Tetrahedron, the star of David, would change name. For instance, the ark went to Zion. The, the star tetrahedron was called the star of Zion. Then the ark went to Solomon. The star tetrahedron was called the shield of Solomon. Then the ark went to, uh, to David. And the star tetrahedron was called the star of David. So the whole, you know, you could actually map the the, the the geometry directly to the movements of the arc. So you knew that the geometry was directly related to the arc. And so I started to, to see more and more evidence of it. And I, I looked in the Bible further and further, and I saw that they actually brought the ark to the Temple of Solomon, and then they built a huge water container in the back of the Holy of Holies. It was called the little sea because it was so big and they would charge the water with the ark you see and so I was very excited I was like because then I realized that all of the pyramids in Egypt including the pyramids in South America and Mexico had waterways that were diverted to go through it all the pyramids of Egypt had waterways going from the Nile into the pyramid. So they were charging the water with the ark and then they would allow the water to be used in the fields and they would get incredible crops. And that's what came, what eventually started baptism with that water, holy waters and so on. And incredible crops. Every year at Yom Kippur, the ark would be taken out of the Temple of Solomon and brought to the waters that they would irrigate the fields with for the rest of the year. This Imagine a technology that creates a huge amount of coherency in the vacuum state polarization, in the structure of space-time around it. Any material that's, a, that, that's around there, and certainly water, because water is so malleable, would take that imprint, would go into high coherence, and start to be able to download much more life force than originally. Um, so I, you know, I started to, um, I, I could see how this whole evolution 
So I'm going to jump ahead. I'm going to give you... Do you guys all follow this? Yeah. See, this is, this is really like a step in a new understanding of what truly happened on earth. I'm kind of going to give you the whole package because I just don't have time to go into the details right now. But it's pretty obvious and it's pretty evident that actually that object has been on this planet for many, many years. That the sun gods brought it to man and the first, the first account of that object having been brought to man by the sun gods is in the Sumerian tablets which says that the sun gods came to the earth and met with man on top of a mountain just like the story of Moses and at the top of the mountain they give them uh, the black sun a black hole and you know the tr and the tree of knowledge in the in the temple in the um, garden of Eden the tree of knowledge is the Kabbalistic tree that we just saw decoded the tree of knowledge was that crystal power that was charging the water and charging the food and generating the Garden of Eden. I believe that advanced civilization found this planet and the planet was not very evolved. And when they found a planet that's not very evolved, they usually try to help it along. Why would they do that? Why would they seed planets? If the universe is a fractal and the universe learns as a result of an open feedback of the fractal nature of space, then if you understand these principles, you would want your local universe, for instance, your local galaxy, to have the most amount of learning centers for the universe. Because more they would be learning more there would be uh, knowledge available for all and more everybody could rise together. So these civilization would see planets all around the earth. Actually, I believe that that's why they still come here and take eggs and sperms from people of the earth to actually seed other planets with. When they get to a planet, they cannot put their gene directly into that planet. Why? Because that would be like bringing a tropical plant to Alaska. It's not going to survive or it's going to create disruptions on the biology of that planet. So what they do is they take the highest species, the most evolved species on that planet, and they cross the genes with them. And that boosts the evolution. In our case, it produced the Homo sapien. And that's why the uh, anthropologists are missing a link. You guys see this? When they give the ark power, the tree of knowledge, to Adam and Eve, the first cross that they had made, Eve figured it out. She was smart. She figured it out. This is why it's represented as an apple, the apple being the double torus. She figured out that this was a technology and it had power that she could use. She figured out how to use that power. And if you read in the Bible, it says, oh no, now man has become in immortal. She figured it out and she gave the trick to Adam. And since the sun gods had kind of, you know, since Adam and Eve had figured it out, I guess they decided that to let them have that type of power right from the start. And that's what generated all of the evolution of Atlantis and Lemuria.
described by Plato. I know this is a lot to take in all at once, <laughs> but I assure you it's not coming out of the side of my mouth. It is coming out of a lot of research. Okay? The, uh, the evolution of Atlantis and Lemuria was flawed from the beginning because these people never learned about destruction. They, all, they, all, they had so much power so fast in their evolution it became eventually corrupted. And then, according to what I've researched, a natural event occurred. A huge meteorite 